Hi guys. Hi there. We are here with another episode of True Hollywood Thursdays. Yay. Yay for Thursdays. Yay for Thursdays. And today we decided that because we did a singer, kind of an actress, but more so singer mm -hmm. last time, that we would do an actor. Yes. Oh, this thing. time. Yes. Who did we decide to do our story on today, dog? Uh, Heath Ledger. Heath Ledger. Heath Ledger. This is a very tragic mm -hmm. one, especially because he had a young daughter when he passed. Very young. It's very, just very, very tragic. Um, Absolutely. Um, so, yeah, so we're going to jump in, talk about him a little bit. Um, we are also going to be testing out a couple new things, so we'll be seeing how we like those two. Yeah, a couple new things. Alright, so Heath Ledger, as you know, is an Australian actor. Yes. He was born April 4th, April baby, just like our babies. Our babies are April babies. Yep. April babies for the win. Mm -hmm. We're November babies, we but are. you know, what can you do? April babies for the win. Um, April 4th. 1979. Yes. To his mother and father. Yes. Heath Ledger and Sal, or no, excuse me, Heath, Heath is his name. Uh, Sally and Kim Ledger. Yes. Well, I think Sally's name now is Sally Bell. Yes. She, um, Heath's parents divorced when he was 11, actually, so, yeah, she remarried and her name is now Sally Bell. Mm -hmm. Um, but his parents, take out her earrings, good plan. Um, his parents, uh, his mom was a French teacher yep. and his father was a race car driver. Yes. Which is kind of freaking awesome. And he also was a mining engineer and I think he... Hmm. Um, the family like owned a mining company. That's pretty cool. Yeah. So it's not like an everyday thing that you hear about. All right. We're trying out new sponges today. I'm yeah, trying we're to trying to figure out how to use it. This Those is... microfiber sponges from Juno. Yeah. Well, I ordered a couple. Down below. It's super inexpensive. I think they're like six bucks a sponge. That's not bad. Yeah, about four and a cleaner for like twenty two dollars. Uh, so he was born in Perth, Australia. That's his hometown. That's what he calls home, where he lived and went to school. So he went to a handful of schools, including an academy that his father went to. Oh, cool. Very yes. Cool. Keeping it in the family. Correct. And then one of his first experiences with acting was when he got cast in the role of Peter Pan oh, yeah, at the I saw age that. of 13. I saw that, and actually that um, was kind of what set him off onto the path of wanting to be an actor. Which and was, I guess his family found that to be super interesting because he was a pretty heavy athlete and super into hockey. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. He um, led his grammar school to their first all-boy victory. Nice. At a singing and performance contest. The Rock. Okay. It was at the Rock I. Steadford, I'm probably pronouncing that incorrectly, and I do apologize. Rock Eyed Steadford uh, challenge, and his school won their first ever all boys victory hmm. under his leadership of their performance troupe. I guess you could say. Nice. Yeah, I saw part of that. It was a dance. Yeah, I saw he was super into Gene Kelly while he was growing up, so he was really into dance. Oh, that's pretty funny because when they did an interview with him about 10 Things I Hate About You, he said that scene where he's like singing in, yeah. the, in the football field, Yeah, he was trying to do like a Fred Astaire, Gene Kelly type thing. Funny. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so he decided early on that he was going to be an actor. Seriously, like he would talk to his coaches and stuff like that and just kind of tell them that, yeah, sports is all good and well, but I want to be an actor. To the point where I guess he even told his dad at one point that he, uh wanted that sports were fun but acting was going to pay the bills. He needed something that would pay the bills and I guess That's his dad kind of laughed at him. Mm -hmm. a little I was watching a documentary that showed some clips of him when he was 16 in a TV show called Sweat. Oh, that's the one where he played the, um... He was an athlete, but yeah. he was uh, 16 in the show always, as well. And he was coming to terms with the fact that he was gay. Yeah. Um, the scenes were pretty powerful, especially considering the time. So this is going on in the 90s. That's not a really, like, you know, True. common thing that's really, that was, at that time, you know, it was a huge deal to have a gay character on TV. Yeah, definitely. So, but he did that at the age of 16, which is very impressive. That's a very mature role to take on, too. Oh, yeah. They said he would pick the roles that were the hardest roles to do. 
I think that part of his influence in wanting to become an actor, not just to do with all the, the stuff in school and things like that, also to do with the fact that his sister, he had an older sister named Kate, who he was super close to, who was also an actress, but also went on to be a publicist. So, you know, Interesting. She, yeah. he had family ties to acting and things like that, but also he was super good at it. Yeah, he was incredibly good at it. So he sat um, early, uh, sat for early graduation uh -huh. from school at the age of 17, and I think we both kind of thought that that was a little strange, just yeah. because, like... Is it not normal? Is that not normal time to be done with, I guess, your, your basics of school, like in America... Like 12 years of school? Yeah, in America, we typically graduate at, six, or at 17 or 18. Yep. We graduated at 17. Yeah, I was a 17-year-old senior, graduated. So, I don't know, but he, um, very intelligent, like, he left school early, and he moved to... Sydney, where he dis where he was pursuing acting. More acting. He went on to star in a bunch of different Australian shows. Well, not star, but he had roles and things yeah, on. Yeah, he would like, take small his... little roles. And... Yeah. And like, uh, Home and Away, which was like apparently a super popular um, soap opera in Australia. Interesting. And then also a show, I think this one was more so geared towards children, was called Ship to Shore. Interesting. And then at that point, he kind of met a Hollywood... Someone in Hollywood who had connections, or he did a role in a film that I cannot remember what it is called. Black Rock. There it is, and yeah. it was a. It was um, in 1997 his film debut. That was his very yeah. first ever film role. Mm-hmm. And that kind of helped other people, Hollywood, take notice of him. And he got connected with somebody who knew somebody who was writing a script for a teen romance. Ooh. Ooh. We talked about it briefly. Anyone know what it is? Ten Things I Hate About You. Ten Things I Hate About You. How many people love that movie? I did. I thought it was great. I thought it was a really great movie. I kind of um, related to the movie, just in the aspect of, uh, was that girl who wasn't super popular, who wasn't super pursued by boys, and, you know, I mean, the whole aspect and concept of the movie, paying somebody to date a girl, or, you know, getting somebody to date that girl so that... They could go after her hot sister. I uh, mean, that's kind of, you know, crazy sexist and crazy ridiculous. Yeah. But it's also based off of a Shakespeare play, uh, Taming of the, the Shrew. Shrew. Yeah. That's what I thought. Um, that movie sort of skyrocketed him to Hollywood heartthrob status. Uh -huh. He went on to star in several other movies after that. Um, a Knight's Tale, uh, The Patriot. Um, just, and, which he said that he absolutely loved filming because he was a huge Mel Gibson fan, like childhood hero right there. Well, of course, Mel Gibson's like one of the most mm -hmm. famous Australian actors was, yeah. of all time. He grew up, you know, on Mad Max and just absolutely loved it. If you think about the times, we all loved Mad Max. Of course we did. You guys have no, been here for a while. Really... You know how I feel about Mad Max. You know. Uh -huh. I don't know how I feel about this sponge. I don't know how I feel about it either. It kind of feels like it dried out real fast, huh? Super fast. I don't know. We'll have to give Spray those a whirl. It. Yeah, and it feels like it's taking up a lot of my product. Can you guys see that? Interesting. Yeah, mine did too. Yeah. It's very strange. One thing, though, about A Knight's Tale was it really cemented him as a, like we were saying, a Hollywood heartthrob. But that was like the first time his face was everywhere. Yeah. He was on true. billboards. He was everywhere. And they were trying to get him to go on, like, you know, press tours and things like that, and apparently he got incredibly uncomfortable and started feeling like he was, um, at a place that there, um, eventually would come a time where he was going to lose it all, and the, this was the beginning of it. The start of the actual rise to fame was the beginning of the end. So, he, it freaked him out. The yeah. Hot, he, the idea of being a superstar freaked him out. He was definitely somebody who was not really into acting for the fame and the fortune. Mm -hmm. He really loved the art of it all. Yeah. Um, and then actually he hit a point um, in his career after some of these, like, you know, these these rom-coms, these teeny movies that, you know, made him his money, that he was able to, and very fortunately I think for him... He broke um, away. Hmm? Broke away from that. Yeah, he broke Stigma. away... He broke away from all of that and was able to start taking roles that he wanted to mm -hmm. and weren't necessarily, you know, like mm -hmm. super huge roles. He was able to turn down, um, I think I saw that he was offered the role of Spider-Man and he turned that down. 
The um, Tobey Maguire Spider-Man? I think so. I mean, that's the only one that makes sense, right? I don't know. Imagine how that, that would have been played. Like, he played an excellent American accent, so, you know. Huh. Um, he took on a role in the movie Monsters Ball. It was a very small role. I believe he played a prison guard. Um, yeah, he played and, um, Billy Bob Thornton's son. Yeah. And he was a prison guard, yeah. Yeah. That was an intense movie. That was a really intense movie. It was a really good movie. Um, I think I mixed too much lightning drops into my foundation. We'll That's warm okay. it up. I'll warm it up with some bronzer. With some bronzes. With some bronzes. So he was able to take on roles like that. Um, he was able to act in a movie called... Um, I think it was called... Wasn't it called Candy or something like that? Uh, yeah, he was able to act in a movie called Candy. He was able to take on a movie I'm Not There. Oh, yeah, that's a good that's one, That's a good too. movie. Um, he played one of... They, it's a movie about Bob Dylan and his many different personalities. Mm -hmm. And Heath played one of the um, personalities. He played the artistic side. Ooh. Sort of the like the dark artistic side of Bob Dylan. Nice. Which is really cool. Um, so yeah, he was able to start doing that because he wanted to. Mm -hmm. He didn't have to accept roles because he had become so successful. Correct. Which is super awesome. Super awesome for him, especially for an, as an actor who was doing it for the love of the work and not, you know, love of fame, love of money. Right. Um, in 2005, there was a movie released that you guys may or may not have heard of. It's kind of an inf infamous movie for a couple different reasons. Um, just an aspect that it is an amazingly beautiful artistic movie, but also... Brokeback Mountain. Brokeback Mountain. He played a Wyoming ranch hand by the name of Ennis Del Mar, who falls in love with a rodeo... Um, rodeo writer, I guess? Would you say? Name Jack Twist. Played by Jake seen? Gyllenhaal. Yeah. Have you guys seen that? Super good. It's a really, really good movie. It's a really, um, it's a beautiful love story. It's kind of a beautifully tragic love story. It is. It is very so incredibly good. I think Just in general, an amazing love story. It is completely tragic. No. It is a very tragic love story. And the funny thing about that movie is, is that it was such a huge movie. Um, that I saw the director Ang Lee say that he had done that because he wanted to pr he wanted to create something small. He wanted to do something small, maybe mm -hmm. that not a lot of people were going to be into, not a lot of people were going to yeah. see. Nobody ever expected it to blow up like it did. Well, it did, sir. It, it did, did absolutely and rightfully so. Yeah, and I saw that that was actually quite a test of Heath Ledger's acting ability because he had never like he had played um, the gay cyclist in Sweat, but he had never actually played like. Uh, love scenes mm -hmm. and um, what he, he had said is he was playing a closeted homophobic man and that was a really intense thing for him to get into and he mm -hmm. he was so uncomfortable playing that character and that's what comes across in Ennis's character is that you see how uncomfortable he is and mm -hmm. who he is and that was because Heath was so uncomfortable and I saw a quote from one of the critics that said he doesn't just know how he uh, how Ennis talks, walks, and moves. He knows how Ennis breathes. Mm -hmm. Like that's how in depth he got into that character. That's the kind of actor he was. Is he just got into his characters? He became his characters. Yeah, that's absolutely true. Um, another quote, just to, you know, kind of put some emphasis on how good this character was and how good his performance was. It was Ledger's. Magnificent performance is an acting miracle. He seems to tear it from his insides. Meaning he put all of it into it. Everything he had into that acting and into that um, role. Now, on the set of Brokeback Mountain, the young lady who played his wife, Michelle Williams. The absolutely adorable Michelle Williams. Yes, adorable, talented, beautiful actress. Like, just all around good person. I don't know, I see stuff that, um, like, articles about her and, and, and the things that she does. It just mm -hmm. seems like she is, would just be an all around, like, awesome person to know. Yeah, that's exactly how I feel about it, too. She seems like she'd be an awesome person, but they met. And there was even a story that the director, um, I don't know if it was, no, I don't know if it was Angley that was talking about this, but it was a producer or somebody talking about she got injured on the, so um, when they went to the hospital, like, Heath went with her and was holding her hand through the whole process, and everyone was like, we just kind of knew what was about to happen. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And so they got together, fell in love. Um, there were so many interviews with 
Heath after they got together where he's just so like bragging about her and just so proud to have her mm -hmm. on his arm. It just really shined through um, because the, loved her. the funny thing is is that he had filmed a movie uh, called Casanova and so you know everybody knows the great lover Casanova. Right. Um, there were you know speculations like he he fancied himself a Casanova because he had previously been linked to a bunch of beautiful women. True. Um, Naomi Watts, Heather Graham, to name a couple, and he actually um, on a red carpet had uh, I think for Casanova yeah. had to basically let them know like no that's not who I am. Maybe when I was a lot younger, but not anymore. You know mm -hmm. like I I'm very proud of who I am and I'm very proud of the relationship that I have. And he was always talking about um, Michelle and then. Eventually, their daughter saying that they had he had two beautiful girls, and he was so proud to have his girls, and it was all due to Brokeback Mountain. Brokeback Mountain, yeah. And so Matilda, Matilda Rose, Matilda Rose, Michelle Williams, and Heath Ledger's little girl was yes. born in October of two thousand and five. Yes. How sweet. Very sweet. And how sweet is that name? Like, Matilda. come on, man, Matilda. I love that name. You just heard that. That was that was my little girl. That was her little Alice, just going crazy, going crazy. She's trying a new thing. Let me see. She's trying a new thing. Oh, that's pretty. I'm looking in the screen of the camera. Ooh. I'm also looking very pale in that camera. So Matilda Rose was born in October. Uh, 2005 so about a year after they had started dating and she was just basically like the light of his life like his family said that he loved being a dad he was proud of yeah. being a dad um, he like the greatest thing he could do was be her dad essentially that was the the greatest joy of his life yeah. which is so heartening to, to hear because you know mm -hmm. I'm I see my husband with our daughter and it just, I can tell. Like, you can tell that is essentially the greatest joy of his life. Yeah, so I can Super fully awesome. relate to, to that situation and just being like, that is so wonderful. That is so awesome to hear. It's just how much, you know, he loved his daughter. So it was about the time after Matilda was born, I think that it started to like... Um, allegations, and I'm not sure if they had been there before with him in the press, but I think... Um, they really started coming out after after he met Michelle and after they had Matilda that yeah. um, he had a contentious relationship with the press. Uh, I know a few paparazzis had accused him of um, spitting at them. Yeah, but I also heard that they showed up to the premier Brokeback Mountain in Australia with squirt guns and they were yeah. shooting them with water. Like they with claimed that that was retaliation. Go to hell. Him and his family attacking them. Hopefully um, they got kicked out. They, I, I believe they did. Yeah, because, you know, that's just totally uncalled for, absolutely unprofessional. 100%. And that's garbage. I'm sorry, but if you're, like, coming up on somebody, like, trying to get in their face and take a picture of their baby... You damn right. I mean, I don't believe he spit at them, but I'm sure he said some words that were rather inappropriate. Which, I mean... But... As a parent... Very appropriate as a parent. Mm -hmm. So, because of that, and this was all in his home country of Australia... He had dreamed of having a second home, a part-time home in Australia for his little family. He ended up actually selling mm -hmm. the property that he had there and moved with Michelle and his little girl to be uh, to live full-time in New York. Yeah. So earlier we made mention of a role in a movie called Candy. This oh. one's fun. This one is very fun. Candy was filmed in 2006 in Australia. And it was filmed with the actress Abby Cornish. Um, and they played young heroin addicts who were in love with each other, but also trying to quit their addiction. So, you know, there are always going to be rumors, especially surrounding his death, as to whether or not it was actually a drug overdose or not. If it was, you know, accidental, whatever, suicide, etc. You know, so it, it's kind of um, interesting that he would play such a role of a recovering drug addict or an attempting recovering drug addict. Now that went on to be nominated for several awards across the um, Australian award circuit. So obviously it was a very, very poignant movie. 
Very poignant movie. Um, Girl, have you met me? Girl, have you met you? Boop and just Ooh. burst into the scene, folks. Uh, Hi. Make a baby. Hi. Mom's hey. right here. Mom's right here. She'll be right hey. down. Almost done, Boop. Almost Promise. done. I had actually seen an interview with Heath. I think it was during a red carpet for Candy, where he was discussing with the reporter that he and Abby had actually gone and met with a heroin addict who they had demonstrate to them how you actually shoot up. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's fun. Um, he demonstrated on a prosthetic arm like they used to train phlebotomists and nurses and things. Um, Interesting. Yeah, how to, you know, find your vein, how to tie off or tie, I don't know, tie up, I don't know. But how to do that and um, the proper angle for the needle. It was like very intense. And then they, uh, he allowed them to film him <gasps> actually shooting up. No, I don't like that. Yeah. And so I'm not he, sure how I feel about that. Right? That's kind of intense. That's a little much. Um, and they, he, um, he made, he called it a little documentary, a mini documentary that they handed out to all of the people who needed to be in the know of how it was properly done. Right. And that I was kind of like, how is that not like, how are you not party to a crime with that? Yeah, like, that's kind of strange to me. Heroin's illegal, so I don't know. But yeah, that I thought that was kind of interesting that that was something that, that, that he did. That kind of shows the depths that he would go to. That's very intense. Yeah. To, to get his character right, he wanted to be able to do it and do it properly, which is that's hmm. nuts. That's absolutely nuts. So again, absolutely. obviously a movie like that went on to win tons of awards. Tons of awards. You go into a, a theme or a, like a, you know, a subject like that, you're going to get noticed and it's going to get talked about and things like that. So that's pretty intense. Um, I believe it was just after that movie that it was rumored that he had um, begun partying a bit. Yes. Yes. It was, and that is actually rumored to be the cause of the split from yes. Michelle Williams. I think at that point they were only, you know, plagued by rumors of a split. Plagued by rumors of a split. Um, and a rift growing between them. But they did eventually confirm a split. They did. Um, now, after all of this, or maybe during all of this, Heath was filming what would be potentially, well, his biggest role of his life. Obviously, for, you know, for very obvious and sad reasons. But also, I don't know if he had gone on to continue acting, if he, he probably would have topped it, but I couldn't imagine what he could have done to top right. this role. And the role that I am talking about is, of course, the Joker. The Joker. Everybody the knows the Joker and that iconic character that he played, the that voice. So um, I had I... seen, after his passing, um, an interview, a red carpet interview with Christian Bale where he described... Um, his character where he described the Joker and he said basically that Heath created this like punk rock almost like yeah. Sid Vicious-esque type character and all I could think is that is exactly perfect. That is exactly perfect and it is kind of funny because oh we both went with the pink. Oh we both went with the colorful this pink. This bright ass pink in this palette is amazing by the way. Mm -hmm. Um but he when he found out that he got the role he locked himself up in a hotel room for about six weeks oh and he created a journal where he was essentially the Joker and he wrote the diary of the Joker but he also was in informed by the director uh, Chris Nolan to watch the um, to watch Clockwork Orange which is you know a very good movie for that sort of trying to get into that mindset girl but then he was also told to look at certain people and Sid Vicious was one of them. Yeah, that's and to I mean, pull that inspiration from that character. If you can think or from of that man. If you can think of the chaos of Sid Vicious, yep. That is exactly right. Oh yeah. Now, of course, when his casting was announced, there were people who were very upset. Because there were people who wanted to see the role go to um like Steve Carell, which I could not imagine 
Michael Scott playing Michael Scott. I'm the watching Joker. The Office right now for like the 20th time. I know, they're but, about to take it off Netflix, side note, sad face. But anyway. Um, Michael Scott, um, Michael Scott, Steve Carell, Steve Carell. Um, and even Robin Williams playing the Joker in that film. Well, I guess they wanted like a funny man, you know, Maybe. in their mind anyway. But it was also looked at for Paul Bettany. Oh, interesting. And I think the other person I saw might have been Jude Law. Interesting. To play the Joker. And Heath wasn't even considered until he came in to audition for Batman. Oh, no. He definitely No, played. no, 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 no. He was not Batman, my friends. He is the Joker. And so he got the role of the Joker. And, you know, the naysayers and stuff like that came out and said, he's a pretty boy. That's the boy next door. The boy next door is not the Joker. Shut up. Blah, 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 blah. We've all seen that movie now. Naysayers be damned. Naysayers, naysayers be damned. Haters be damned. Go to hell, haters. Because that ended up being, and he shut down all the critics, obviously, because, like, when the first trailer they said came out, everyone was just anticipating and blown away and just, like, mind blown because in yeah. that first trailer you got not only got his joker laugh but you got two of his sayings which was you want to know how i got these scars and why so serious so good i mm. loved his character my favorite scene hands down was when he was coming into <laughs> the the room where all the gangsters were meeting mm -hmm. and he goes you want to see me make this pencil disappear and then he smashes the guy's head on it and he goes it's gone because it's in the dude's head, y'all. <laughs> He's smashing. The dude just falls. It's hilarious. I mean, the, I mean, the dude died. He died. But, I mean, it's gone. Like, that was amazing. He was amazing, really amazing in that role. Oh, my God. Um, so there were always all, like, talks and stuff about how he was on set. Because he, you know, people were concerned, obviously, after he passed away, that there was, like, this whole theory that the becoming the Joker killed him essentially that he yeah, like dove the, into this depression the darkness of the joker no number one he was quoted as saying it was the most fun he'd ever had playing a character and then number two um he was said to be seen on set not um everyone said that he was all constantly in character never wrote character on set when he was in costume not true he was actually there giving hugs to people cracking jokes running around laughing um, things like that. One of my favorite things is, like, probably the most iconic picture from the behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. It shows him jumping his skateboard over Christian Bale in, um, the bat suit, in the bat costume. And he's like, in costume? real. Like, yeah, and he's That's in full costume. That's so awesome. One of my other favorite little stories from set was that he made, when he, when, um, he was in costume the very first time, the legendary actor, Michael Caine. Sir Michael Caine saw him in person, in in full costume and character, he forgot his lines. So that tells you how intense of an actor he was. Right. That you make an acting legend actually forget what he's doing. So, you know, obviously he did something very right. And for those of you who've seen the movie, you know that he did something very right. So, after his arguably... Not even arguably. Like, definitively iconic. Definitively iconic and I'm going to say arguably the best Joker that we've seen played. Sorry, um, what's his name fans? Jared Leto. I didn't like his Joker. Yeah, I wasn't a fan. But, I mean, he's a good actor. Yeah, he's a great actor. Just not the Joker because yeah. Heath Ledger kind of... Heath Ledger is the Joker. There was a bar set with Jack Nicholson, obviously. Oh, yeah. As the Joker. He was amazing. Of course. But then I think Heath kind of took it and just elevated that performance. Yeah, and there's a new Joker movie coming out, so we will have to see how Joaquin Phoenix does. I love Joaquin Phoenix, Phoenix fans, so I'm rooting for him. Me too. But Heath is still like my number one. I mean, one. after the Jared Leto Joker, no offense, Jared Leto. I don't know, because you're watching this, obviously. Obviously, mm. uh, Jared Leto stumbled upon our channel. Hi, I don't know that Joaquin has that big of shoes to fill if he's following in your footsteps. My bad, I know that's really harsh and stuff. I like Jared Leto, big fan of his music, stuff like that. I got a couple of his songs on my running playlist and stuff. But she whatever. Does. She really does. I do. Love it. Anyway. I'm really loving this palette. I'm just going to go ahead God, and say it. God, I need to. Holy Mirage fuck. palette. This we got at uh, Walmart today for 13 This bucks. is hand, like, 
Look at the position. Okay, anyway, continue. So, so like we said earlier, yes, like we mentioned briefly, he and Michelle Williams had broken up over, um, it was never confirmed, but it was rumored that he was partying a lot. Yes. Yes. Um, especially after the movie Candy, and then, um, I'm sure dealing with this as well, like playing the Joker and getting into that character, and like you said, he locked himself up for like six weeks. Mm -hmm. um, probably played a role as well. Oh, absolutely, I'm sure. But he was finding that his like anxiety was getting really bad. Um, he was losing sleep, essentially. He wasn't sleeping more than like two hours a night, I think he said. Yeah, and he was taking Ambien to remedy that, but the Ambien... One wasn't working, so he would end up taking two, and he said that he would more so find himself in a stupor rather than necessarily falling asleep. So he was he was kind of abusing, but he was trying to get he was trying to get rest because obviously he had something to do. So I don't know that he was abusing for the sake of abusing. Yeah, I don't think he was abusing for the sake of abusing. I think he was just desperately trying to find anything that would work to help him out. Um, and all while this was going on, he began filming a movie called The Imaginarium of Dr. Parnassus. That is an amazing, amazing movie. Um, but he experienced many health problems while mm -hmm. filming that. Uh, many of the, the cast did as well. They were constantly sick because what they were filming in was like dark, damp, dank places. They were in and, uh, London for yeah. filming. So, you know, yeah. there's a stereotype about London being kind of gloomy yeah. and stuff like that. But, you know, it happens. Yeah, it happens. And they were like deliberately filming in, in many of these places to kind of create the atmosphere that was the movie. If you've seen the movie, you know that there... It, it, you know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. Certain scenes were filmed in just like really grungy, like dark, damp places. And he was getting sick. He actually, I think, ended up with an upper respiratory infection that turned into walking pneumonia. Yes. Um, the rest of the cast also had these upper respiratory infections, but they were going to the doctor and getting them treated. And for some reason, he wasn't getting his properly treated. So he had pneumonia at the same time he was dealing with his separation that he was really apparently taking very hard um, and his anxiety, the stresses of fame, um, all of these things that were kind of coming down in on him, right. basically. He, all at once. Can you imagine how hard yeah. that would be to deal with? He would say his, he could, his body would be so exhausted but he couldn't get his mind to stop, yep. which was one of the reasons why he doubled up his Ambien. So on a break from the filming of the movie, he went home to New York. Yes, he did. And unfortunately, on um, January 22nd of 2008, at 3 p.m., he was found, um, as they said, unconscious by his massage therapist. He had and a scheduled appointment with her. His cleaning lady, his housekeeper. Now, some interesting things about this, which I thought, I found, in, like, not interesting, but a little bit, like, confusing, um, were that they called Mary-Kate Olsen first, and they found of him. And what, I'd be like, okay, maybe, like, a friend who was in town, like, maybe she was supposed to be there, and she ran to go get them coffee or something. But no, she was in California at the time, so why would, yeah, why that's would you call? Yeah, that's incredibly strange. That's, that that's who weird. they would call. And so she, I guess, called her security to come over, and then they eventually called 911 where they were directed to do CPR, and which they did. But it was obviously unsuccessful in resuscitating him. The uh, first responders showed up at the same time as the security. But so then at 3, I believe it was 3.36 p.m., he was declared dead. They were unable to revive him, and he was not... There was no way. They could not do it, and it wasn't going to happen. He was declared dead. So, you know, I had thought that there was also, like, they, they weren't sure if he was dead when they found him or not. So my thought process is, is had the masseuse and the housekeeper maybe called 911 first? Maybe. Like... Maybe. You could, so mean, it was never actually officially released. Like when they did the autopsy, they didn't. They released like the cause of death and the mixture of everything that was in his system, but they never said when his exact um, time of death was. But it is rumored that it was like two hours before they, he was found. Yeah. So 
you know, if that's the case, then no, they couldn't have saved him, but still, you don't fucking call an actress first. Uh, yeah, no. You find somebody unconscious. You call. You call 911. 911, and you, you know. start. And now, I know that. that there were rumors that it was, like, a heroin overdose or some sort of overdose, but the police actually came out and said that they found no illicit drugs at the scene. No, they were um, all They found a rolled-up $20 bill, but they found no cocaine, no traces of cocaine. I so. didn't see anything about cocaine in the autopsy either. Yeah, there was no cocaine. So maybe he just um, had a weird way of storing his 20s. Uh, maybe. Maybe. I don't know. But um, what they did end up finding was that it was an accidental death caused by acute intoxication of the following drugs, oxycodone, hydrocodone, diazepam, temazepam, oh al alprazolam, sorry I'm looking at a list, and dioxalamine, 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 which you know, oxy and hydrocodone, those are some, those are some hardcore painkillers, yeah, those are op opioids and those are highly regulated, correct. Now, um, there was a theory that came out, not to jump ahead a few years, but there was a theory that came out in 2017 that said if it had not been for the oxys and the hydrocodone, that he would have survived. That the, the combination wasn't lethal until those painkillers were introduced. Yeah, because it was painkillers, anti-anxiety medication, and I think sleeping pills. Yep. That's why they say don't mix your drugs, folks. Yeah. Don't mix your drugs. Do not mix your drugs. No, one of the weird things was obviously there was an investigation into his death. Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, it was a huge deal in Hollywood. I remember exactly, not that we're in Hollywood, but, you know, it was a huge deal in Hollywood. It was a huge deal everywhere. I remember exactly where I was when I found out that Heath Ledger had died. Yeah, I remember where I was, and I remember thinking, no. I think I might have texted her about it and was like, hey, did you just, Heath Ledger's dead. Yeah, I think you did, actually, and I was just like, kind of, no, because, like, mm -hmm. you see interviews with him, you see all of these things, and he seems like a really level-headed person, because at the time, it was all, all of the, the speculation was, like, heroin overdose or yeah. something, because of the movie Candy, I believe, Probably. and, um, it's like, no, he's, like, a super good family man, he's got, like, he's got his little girl that right. he's so proud of, and he never comes across as a junkie. Like, none of the, the scandals about him had anything to do, really, with drugs. Like, he partied a bit, but, you know, it wasn't like Heath Ledger's busted for drugs or anything like no. that. So, I had a hard time believing it, and I just figured so maybe I. somebody was found dead in his apartment. Well, because apartment. it was, like, this huge deal. The freaking, he was about to be, he was about to be the Joker. The Joker, man. The Joker. And the previews were out, and they looked phenomenal. And so, you know, it was a huge deal. And then I saw an interview with his family. It's actually, there's a lot, nice documentary on him. There's a couple I watched too. Yeah. Um, he, it was called I Am Heath Ledger. And it had an interview with his family um, and his parents. And it was just talked about like the chaos and stuff. Well, not necessarily the chaos, but the chaotic feeling that they had when they were trying to get a hold of him. They, you know, had been heard rumors and things like that, and they couldn't figure out, like, what the hell's going on? This can't be real. Trying to call their loved one to make yeah. sure he's not dead. That this is crap. Like, it's not it's real. A Hollywood hoax, you know? Everybody has those, right? Yeah. How many times have I seen... Morgan what? Freeman, how many times Yeah, yeah. how many times have I seen that he's dead, you know? Like, yeah. or Betty White. They're, con they're killed every year, and then they have to come out on their Twitter and be like, no. Yeah, but I'm not dead yet. Yeah. So, you know... The family kind of dealt with all of that. Um, it was it's it's pretty awful. But one of the weird things that I saw came out in the investigation was that Mary Kate Olsen refused to speak through to anyone. She spoke through her lawyer, and she requested um, immunity from prosecution, which caused a fury of rumors. What do you need immunity from prosecution for? Did you give him the drugs, sweetheart? No, because they also investigated two doctors um, that were Heath's doctors, and they um, eventually dropped all charges against them, or didn't, didn't pursue charges against them, excuse me, um, because they determined that while they were prescribing him medication, he they did not prescribe him the uh, medication that caused that lethal combination. So it wasn't them. So he so, had no prescription for the drugs. Correct. And in all so in all honesty, no one knows where he got the drugs. Yeah. Nobody knows where he's got the drugs and 
um, I believe that they eventually just either stopped pursuing or just gave up on the whole Mary Kate Olsen thing. Yeah, they did. Uh, they had a subpoena. They considered it and all. They just closed everything. The uh, U.S. Attorney closed everything down for the investigation. Interesting. And that was that. That was that. His death was ruled 100% accidental. Accidental. Accidental overdose. Which that's awful. Absolutely terrible. So, he went on to be buried in his hometown of Perth, Australia. Yes, indeed. Um, he had his entire family there, his loved ones. Michelle Williams was there. There was a beautiful picture of Michelle Williams playing on the beach um, during that time frame. So, after his death, uh -huh. of course, when dealing with a movie star who has just an abundance of wealth. There was controversy over his will. I think will. he was valued at 20 million after Ooh. Batman. So there was controversy um, with his father coming forward saying that he would absolutely want Michelle Williams and his their daughter Matilda to be cared for. Their, their financial well-being would be an absolute priority for him. But apparently Heath never actually signed a new will after he met Michelle and they had Matilda. His last will had been signed officially in 2003. Bro, what is you doing? Like, I don't have a will right now, but Get that's something I've been looking into. I have a will. Because once you have kids, man, you've got to make sure that everything is in writing solid. Like, who's yeah. going to take care of them? Where is all your stuff going to go? Like, I own property. i got to make sure that that's in my yeah. will as to who's going to get that. You know? Yeah. So everything goes to my son. Um, yeah, yeah, so some of the random things, like eventually it all got settled, obviously. Yes. Um, and everything ended up going to Matilda so that she could Rightfully. Have, um, be taken care of and things like or so that she could be taken care of. One of the interesting things that I thought that she was left was um and it was determined by the actual um academy was his Academy Award that he won, which we didn't mention. He won an Academy Award for Best Supporting Actor for his portrayal of the Joker. Posthumously. Mm -hmm. She says posthumously. I say posthumously just because Jessica's fancy and bougie, and I'm probably saying it wrong, but I ain't care. Um, he won it. And a lot of people thought he won it because he died, but if you've paid attention to his performance, it was definitely deserved. Dude, but it was you know. amazing. He was so good in that movie. Um... Yeah, so basically, like, the family, I guess there there were relatives saying, no, 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 we're all due stuff, too, and it's like, no, but bro. the family ended Come up on. Um, settling money and the baby. gifting Matilda. She was, she was, what, two when he passed away? I believe so. Come yeah. on. Be decent. So. All right, so I think we are both about done with our practice makeup looks, so. Mm. I've been loving this. I don't know why I'm setting this. I'm going to wipe it off here. Yeah, but we're doing the whole face, okay? Might as well, right? Got to practice loving the whole this stuff. thing. This is good. I'm still pissed I didn't pick it up. Anyway, we can go back to a different one and see if they got it. Oh my god. So, that concludes our video. That concludes our video on Heath Ledger who died tragically at the age of 28. 28 years old. 28 so young. Years old. That is so incredibly young, so incredibly talented, and such an incredible, you know, waste. Yes, you kind of um, wonder what would have happened. What would have happened if he had stayed? If, if this hadn't happened? Right. Where would he be? But at the same time, he might not have this iconic status that he has now. It is unfortunate that you receive this kind of status because of your death. Right. But, Absolutely. I mean, I guess it makes us appreciate more what he gave us. Yeah. Um, Definitely appreciate more what he gave us. Definitely. Yeah. Um, interested in seeing some of his work that I haven't seen, like Ned Kelly. I still haven't seen The Imaginarium of Dr. Parnassus It's so yet. good. It's so, so good. So I want to see yeah. that one. Um, but yeah, so hopefully you guys enjoyed this video. Um, we uh, enjoy filming these things because we get to practice with new makeup and stuff like that yeah. and test things out before we actually put it on our face and go on about our day and have to walk around looking like this, which yeah. I'm actually pretty happy with this pinky purple glitter thing that I've come did up with. Did you do pinky purple? I did pinky purple. OMG. Look. OMG. We weren't even discussing looks ahead of time. It's the twin thing. Mm -hmm. So, if you guys did enjoy this video, please feel free to give it a thumbs up. Click that subscribe button down below. Click. If you haven't done so already. And uh, also leave us a comment down below letting us know who you want us to cover next. We have a nice list that's growing with nice a lot of really interesting people. We're really excited to do 
So, um, we will see you guys very, very soon. Very, very soon. In the next one. In the next one, guys. Bye, guys. Bye, guys.